reality, and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. interesting that a lot of uh, places will celebrate the 4th of July on, say, the 3rd of July or the 2nd of July. I mean, or not, never the 5th, but they'll ramp up and they'll do something the night before. Here where I live, they had a major fireworks display 
uh, out on the water, out in the bay, and that was at um, that was on the third of July. It's fascinating. Not really, but it's interesting because we we give so much importance to a date, and we give um, uh, so much importance uh, to the the um, uh, well the, the the not just the date but the tradition. And if you take the Fourth of July out of the third uh, and put it on the third, it just it kind of messes with the resonance a little bit. Although yesterday there was a full moon in Capricorn. And we're going to talk about that, at least I'm going to talk about that, and you're going to listen unless you want to get on the show and talk about it with me, in which case you're more than welcome because this is your show and this is my show. So we can show up together and discuss the uh, the 4th of July. So one of the things I wanted to, to get into a little bit was the, uh, the chart of the United States and uh, theoretically why the date was chosen for this day. Now, there was a rush to get the uh, the paperwork signed to uh, seal the deal. And um, as a result of that, um, there was a conflict when they were signing the, the document that would formally announce the intention to become a republic and to clearly state in ways that had not been stated in Western Europe so explicitly. Now, if you look at the Declaration of Independence, um, there are bits and pieces that Jefferson and some of the other framers had kludged from. Obviously, one was the Magna Carta. Uh, there was another uh, piece of, uh, I'm not even sure if it was literature, but it was, uh, it was related to the Algonquins and sort of their their tribal rights, um, that is actually living inside the Declaration of Independence. A little bit of Plato's Republic is inside the Declaration of Independence, and some of Francis Bacon's Atlantis is also inside of the Declaration of Independence. And Atlantis was a document that uh, deeply influenced all the founders, since most of them were Freemasons or Rosicrucians, Rosicrucianism has its birth in this country, in Philadelphia, by the way, the very same place where the Declaration of Independence was signed. So the story behind this is, is that John Adams and uh, I believe John Quincy Adams, some of the other, uh, I think it might have even been Van Buren, they're all hustling to get this done. And they wanted to get it done on the second, they wanted to get it done on the third, well, there was a, an astrologer in their midst, and that astrologer was Ben Franklin. And um, now there's some discussion as to whether or not Franklin um, was uh, in, in, in contact with uh, a guy by the name of Ebenezer Sibley, Dr. Ebenezer Sibley. Because what they decided to do was they decided to wait until the 4th. Well, why? Well, because at that time, the moon was firmly in the sign of Aquarius versus the sign of Capricorn. And as a result of that, it gave the United States a very different emotional tenor. Because as we know, the moon represents what? Emotions, right? Emotions. And when we look at theoretically the formalizing, and the United States, I mean, let's be clear about this. The United States existed before it was the United States. I mean, there were a lot, there was a lot going on here. You know, there were there were a number of fairly sophisticated, uh, you know, first people nations who had their own thing going on. So the United States is not something new, but what happened was that there was something new happening as a result of the incursion of the, uh, what I would call the explorer race coming from England and coming from Holland uh, and, and to some extent to France, from France to this country. 
So what they were doing as an extension of Western Europe was different. And so now we have this formalized declaration, this intent. Who knows what the real theoretical chart of the United States is predating any of this. But we know that this chart represents the beginning of our time as a republic, for better or worse. So with the moon in Aquarius, what this did in the estimation of the, 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 the framers and the founders, particularly Franklin, the Kabbalist, an astrologer, some say a necromancer, uh, some say a near dwell. He spent most of the American Revolution in France, by the way, drinking the best cognac, eating the best food, having dalliances with the prettiest French women, doing his very best to get financing for the Americans. So Ben Franklin, Ben Franklin had a good gig during the uh, American Revolution. But what they did is by having the moon as the emotional component for the United States is that they were investing in an Aquarian dream. They were investing in an Aquarian soul. And they understood Aquarius as to be as being the sign that would be the the uh, the great unifier. And that and that the United States of America would be driven by an emotional impulse towards a sense of fraternity, brotherhood, and unification. Now, again, you've got to understand these guys were Rosicrucians. They were Freemasons. Aquarius plays a very uh, significant role in those uh, organizations. Very significant. The 11th house is all about uh, organizations and groups and foundations. On the cusp of the 11th and 12th, you've got the, the sort of the inception of the secret society, the 12th being a very secret society. So that's where we see Aquarius, and they knew that. Ben Franklin knew that. He also knew, theoretically, that if the United States had been born with a Capricorn moon, it would be a very different experience, extremely different. Now, one of the things, and how would it be different? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. Thank you. I heard somebody ask that. It would be different because Capricorn has a very, um, well, has a very different impetus than Aquarius. Capricorn wants to achieve, wants to ascend. Capricorn wants to uh, be recognized on some level as a um, source of mm, leadership or power, not even leadership per se, but power. And Capricorn will do anything in, in, in some ways to go about doing that. And I've talked about this before. If you look at a goat. A goat will eat anything. They'll eat anything. And in some ways, that's kind of the astrological DNA of Capricorn. And so why would you want to found a nation with that kind of moon? I mean, I think they wanted to stave off fascism for as long as they could. And they did that by giving it a by giving this country an Aquarian moon. Now what's interesting is is that there is a yod with that moon. And the yod exists between uh, the uh, mer between Mercury, which is at 25 degrees, Cancer, and Libra, and um, Saturn, which is at 15 degrees Libra. You know, the United States just went through its Saturn return over these past two years. And we can kind of see that Manifest in things like the uh, the Occupy movement, uh, people becoming aware of what's happening, waking up, getting a clue, and and seeing the disparity between the haves and the have-nots. It almost went off 
it almost went off on on uh, on cue when we went from 2008 to 2009 with Pluto moving into, into Capricorn, and then we had the the quote unquote uh, the uh, downturn, which was really just another another term for a heist, which took place significant heist. So we've just gone through our Saturn return as a as a country, and we're almost we're almost out now. In terms of the U.S. chart, Saturn is now uh, actually in the 11th house of the U.S. chart. It had been in the 10th house, so it had been in the house of Capricorn, but it's moving on now. And I believe that that the uh, this whole idea of fraternity and um, liberty through fraternity. We'll see some of this between now and October. And then what happens is, is that Saturn moves into Scorpio and it will still be in the US 11th house. But the energy will be very different. It will be very different. And conversely, it will, it will go like this. On one level, we will see more and more groups do what they can to empower themselves and to, uh, to 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 codify their position. And when I, and when I say groups, I'm talking about I'm not talking about I'm not talking about gov- governmental groups or fake special interest government groups like Acorn or something like that. I'm talking about real people trying to get together, trying to form some semblance of connectivity and empowerment. You're going to see a lot of you're going to see a lot of this start to take place. Because people are going to realize that the world that is coming at them is not something they can handle alone. And so we see this already begin to happen on Facebook. You know, that's Saturn, you know, moving towards the 11th house and getting into the 11th house. And in fact, Saturn was in the 11th house already. It moved backwards. But it spent a fair amount of um, 2011 in the United States 11th house. But then it moves into Scorpio, and it goes from the ideation of engagement through social groups and organizations, from the ideation, which is Libra, into the activation, which is Scorpio. Now, even though Libra is a cardinal sign and initiated this movement, the activation takes place in Scorpio because Scorpio represents sacral energy. It is, it is the power of sex. It is a fixed sign. And this is, this is when people at, say to themselves, how can we fix this? How can we fix what's going on in our world? And with Saturn moving into Scorpio in the U.S. 11 towns, we're going to see more people trying their best to come together and create systems, groups, um, networks, so that they can share resources, share insights, protect one another. I'm telling you, this is coming. Now, I think it's great, uh, but I don't think the people that are, are keeping an eye on the rest of us will think it's all that great, which is why they're keeping an eye on the rest of us, because they want to know who's hanging out with who, how this is all going, who's in a moment's notice, if they wanted to do something. Um, well, at least they have the information on hand. One of the things that's interesting about the, uh, the United States moon in Aquarius is that it forms a yacht. And I talked about this before as, a, well, as I was getting into Saturn. The yacht is um, the sex. It, there's a very there's a wide gap between um, the sextile of the moon to Mercury and the moon to Uranus. And what's interesting about that is that in, in a classic sense, it's not just the angles, but it is what is between the angles, because that's where the activity of the yod takes place. 
So what are we talking about? We're talking about from the eighth house to the tenth house. The eighth house being the house of resources, other people's resources, Scorpio, life, death, sex, transformation, drugs, over the counter, under the counter, behind the counter, through the counter. It has to do with death, taxes, legacy. In the middle of the yacht is the ninth house, which is ruled by Sagittarius, expansion of consciousness, or the, the relationship to consciousness expanded. You can't expand consciousness. It just is. You can theoretically discover the God particle, though. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, and then the ninth house also represents foreign involvements, foreign engagements, philosophy, law, religion. And then the tenth house is obviously... Uh, the world, work, corporations. And so where we see the the flux, the flux in the field of the yod takes place between house eight and house 10. And that's where the majority of change is taking place right now is on the backside of that yod. Now, when we look at the United States, ninth house, we see that it's in the sign. Again, this is a Sibley chart, the sign of Virgo. And there, up there in Virgo is, um, what is that, that, that bad boy? Uh, that's uh, Neptune right up there in the sign of Virgo. So Neptune and Virgo. And one of the things that we've been dealing with uh, just recently is, is this whole issue with Obamacare. And uh, the what happened with the Supreme Court, again, ninth house material, Supreme Court, Obamacare, Virgo, healing, Neptune, hey, deception, sorry, calling as I see it, it's happening there in the yacht. And so what happened, too, is that Mars was passing over Neptune, the United States Neptune, when the Supreme Court went into session to talk about this and figure out what they wanted to do. So there we have a huge, huge element of change for this country. And what we've been dealing with really is for the last four years, maybe the last, let's be generous, last 12 years, is the space between the 10th house and the 8th house in the yard. One of the issues in this country is taxation, which is the 8th house. It's in Cancer. And we just have uh, Mercury there as a nation in Cancer. And um, it all started really with Bush and the tax cuts for the quote-unquote rich. And that's been going on for quite a while and now we have this mandate which is a tax it's a tax it's the only way they could get it through the the uh, supreme court by the way is by naming a tax and then they flip it around and say well it's not a tax how schizophrenic is that the only way they could pass obamacare was by having the supreme court name it as a tax and they say it's a tax and yet the administration says, no, it's not a tax. It's an amendment. <laughs> crazy, huh? Totally crazy. Jupiter is coming up on the United States Gemini. Not quite there yet. It's at two degrees, three degrees right now. It'll be there um, by August. and will be on uh, the United States Uranus which would be interesting because, again, it's the sixth house in the chart of the United States. What is the sixth house? It is health, service. And I don't think we've really written the final chapter here um, on Obamacare or health care in this country. Even though the Supreme Court, which is theoretically the final word, I don't think it's um, – I don't think it's a done deal. Not when I see Jupiter 
coming up on the uh, NATO Uranus. And in fact, the Venus transit went over, it started uh, in the United States, seventh house of relationships, and then went back and crossed over uh, Mars in Gemini in the United States chart, and then it crossed over Uranus in the United States chart. And then, believe it or not, when the Supreme Court did make their decision, uh, Venus was direct and moving towards the Uranus in the sixth house in Gemini. So for once, I think Obama's astrologer had it right, or got it right, in terms of timing. But I still don't think it's over yet. Because Jupiter will come in, and I think there's going to be more legal challenges, not to the validity of it, because apparently the Supreme Court has traitorously decided that it's okay, because it's a tax but how it can be modified. And there are going to be challenges to it. And because uh, Jupiter rules uh, law and um, all, all matters judicial, you'll see a number of lawsuits break out at a very small level. I mean, we're talking literally, you know, thousands of lawsuits against the government, ranging from individuals to communities to states, small businesses, and it won't be about the validity of Obamacare. It will be about how they can alter it, opt out, change it. And what's, kind of, what's, really, what's really troubling about this is that in a lot of ways we're fighting ourselves, right, because the government will just tap into tax dollars your tax dollars, my tax dollars, and they will use those tax dollars to hire lawyers and fight and fight people. It's an amazing um, concept if you think about it. The one big thing that I also see coming is the, the battle for Social Security. That's on its way. Trust me on that. That's a, that's a destined battle, by the way, because... The United States has mercury in cancer uh, in its eighth house, which is legacy, other people's money, legacy, Social Security. Supposing Pluto uh, in Capricorn, the United States second house. So it's bound, it's, it's bound to happen. It is bound to happen. Now, the question is, when will it happen? I'm assuming that you're going to see the first shot across the bow uh, coming when uh, just before Saturn goes into uh, Scorpio. Because at that time, Saturn will be squaring the United States Pluto and squaring the United States Mercury in the eighth house. You are going to see this, okay? Now, it may come up uh, as a... Um, it may come up as an issue between the uh, quote-unquote two candidates... But I'm thinking it'll probably be um, triggered during that square and really come up in November once whoever theoretically is crowned the winner will then make an announcement that will rock people. You know, one of the things that they did uh, prior to Obama coming in is they, they did a lot of uh, uh, predictive programming. And the predictive programming came via Biden and via uh, Colin Powell, saying that he would have to deal with a crisis of incredible import. And he's going to ask things of you that you are not um, maybe necessarily willing to commit to. So they got people thinking about how this is going to impact them. It stirred up a lot of fear. And if not fear, sorry, alarm. When was the last time any other person or persons talked about an incoming president like that? They never said it for Bush. Never said it for Bill Clinton. For Obama, they they said, "Hey, he's got a he's got something big on the horizon, and he's going to have to deal with it, and he's going to need your help." A crisis. Well, they're going to do that again. They'll do that again in uh, October, whether it's Obama 
or Romney. A lot of people think Obama is going to win. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if he'll win. I said he was going to be a one-term president, and I may I may eat those words, but I'm not sure he's going to win. I'm not even sure he's going to be an election, to be honest with you. I and mean, we've got the London Olympics to go through. Don't forget that. That's a big one. Anyway, I do see Social Security being a major issue, and it's a major issue right after the election. Saturn and Scorpio legacy. That's the next big thing. The next big thing. That is the austerity cushion. And once and look, we can be really honest. Look, Social Security is probably already gone. Okay, just trust me on that. It's probably already gone. But the ability to deliver two generations out, well, that'll be uh, yeah. That's in doubt. That's really in question. Uh, yesterday was a couple of interesting birthdays yesterday. One was uh, Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise born July 3rd. And I don't know if you've been following the uh, the breakup of Tomcat, Tom and Katie, but uh, they're, they're done. She's Katie's on her way out. Tom got his baby. What's interesting about the breakup is that Katie Holmes and Nicole Kidman – and uh, Mimi Rogers all left Tom Cruise at the age of 33. Isn't that fascinating? I think it's fascinating. 33. What's up with that? By the way, Tom Cruise's new movie is sinking like a rock. Rock of Ages is sinking like a rock. I mean, I think on paper it probably sounded good. Hey, Let's do a rock and roll version of Glee for adults. And we'll have Tom Cruise as the lead. So they get Tom Cruise, heavy hitter. They've got Alec Baldwin. They've a lot of a, there's a lot of A-list actors in that movie. And Alec Baldwin, based on his success with 30 Rock, that guy's an A-list actor. And the movie it just sunk like a rock. So he's got a new movie coming out in uh, November. Saturn and Scorpio. It's called Jack Treacher. Have you ever seen have you seen the trailers for it? Basically he plays a vigilante. Out for justice. And there's no he has no morality. He just goes after who he thinks is bad. So here we have a a white male, renegade white male on the loose. Hello. Well, snap, crackle, pop. Um, so that's Tom Cruise's future, getting us ready for the renegade. He's driving around in a 1970s, I think, GTO. So it's casting a certain light, right? It's putting him in a certain, it's putting him in a certain demographic, shall we say? Tom Cruise is looking younger as he's getting older. I don't know if you've noticed that. He, you know, either they've got they've got the, either the clone, the, the cloning technology has become really sophisticated, and there's major upgrades, or he's found some kind of technology inside of uh, Scientology to reverse the aging process. But one of my favorite uh, Tom Cruise movies, and I, I look, I think Tom Cruise is actually a pretty good actor. I'm not here to slag Tom Cruise. It's probably incredibly disingenuous in terms of who he is and what he what he shows the public as a face. I mean, most people know that he's gay. I mean, come on now. Uh, did you, if, if you saw Eyes Wide Shut, um, there's a scene in Eyes Wide Shut where Tom Cruise's character is on the streets and uh, he gets roughed up by a group of young men who accuse him of being gay. And um, it's part of his journey uh, into the labyrinth of his own psyche, his own unexamined, naive psyche. And also uh, Kubrick was messing with Tom Cruise and maybe the public and trying to flesh out 
you know, the real Tom Cruise. It's an interesting scene. Anyway, uh, I do like Tom Cruise, though, in terms of his movies, some of his movies. Born on the Fourth of July, where he plays Ron Kovic, excellent movie. Oliver Stone, excellent film. And uh, what else? What else do I like Tom Cruise in? I thought Minority Report was pretty good, but of course it's a it's a Orwellian vision of the future. It supports kind of you know surveillance and thought crime. It supports it, you know. But they they did what they did with all the uh, Philip K. Dick's movies. Philip K. Dick's movies are supposed to be like big red flashing lights. So that people will understand what's going on, and his, uh, his, the treatment of his movies cinematically are anything but that. They're not big red flashing lights. In a lot of ways, they're kind of like love poems, like Blade Runner, and even Minority Report. There's no real resolution in terms of Minority Report, in terms of the surveillance stuff. That stuff continues. The thought crime kind of, you know. There might be an abatement to thought crime. It's interesting. Charlize Theron plays one of those uh, beings in in that movie, one of the psychic beings. That that's where she emerges. Really, is from that movie. That's like her psychic goo, and she and she merges into our consciousness. She's born, literally born, you know, out of that movie. Anyway, Tom Cruise's birthday yesterday, very connected to, quote, unquote, America. You know, born on the 4th of July, he's born on the 3rd of July. Julian Assange's birthday yesterday as well. Interesting. He uh, he shows up in the U.S. chart, and he shows up right around, uh, where are we? Ba, 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 ba. Just, just before the U.S. Venus in the U.S.'s seventh house. So Julian Assange is actually quite connected to the United States, no matter what you think of Julian Assange. Andy Griffith passed away. Talk about uh, America and the soul of America. Man. I tell you, the Andy Griffith show and that and that vision of the United States, it seems like another planet now. It seems like an entirely different dimension. I mean, everything about that just seems so utterly foreign. Although I will say, you know, Andy was a single dad. It wasn't your typical, you know, leave it to Beaver, Ozzie, and Harriet scene. You know, Andy dated. And there was good old Aunt B hanging around. Dispensing her unique wisdom. You couldn't do a show like that anymore. First of all, the ratings would be terrible. Second of all, unfortunately, the cast, almost all Caucasian. And to have a show that, you know, would be all Caucasian, now we couldn't get it done. Couldn't get it done for a number of reasons. And I'm not saying it would be a good thing to get them, because it's not really a representation of the world that we're living in now. And maybe it was a representation of the world we were living in then. But I know a lot of people uh, who love Andy Griffith and what he stood for, at least what he stood for on TV. And I'm sure he was not that far removed from the man, the character that he played on Mayberry RFD. And what do we have? We have Ron Howard and Jim Neighbors. They're the last ones. Of that show, Don Knotts is gone. George Lindsay, who played Goober, just passed away recently as well. Ron Howard, of course, is a high-ranking Mason. And uh, Jim Neighbors is... um, (laughs) Jim Neighbors. So Jim Neighbors, I don't know... 
I'm on this celebrity kick today. I don't know what it's about. So Jim Neighbors apparently was a Burt Reynolds lover for a while. The seamy side of Hollywood, Hollywood Babylon. Jim Neighbors, Burt Reynolds lover. And uh, apparently Jim Neighbors very well endowed anatomically. I do not know this firsthand, but it's Hollywood scuttlebutt. All right. Uh, I have riffed for 40 minutes on the state of America, and it is a very surreal state right now as we speak. And in fact, it's so surreal. I saw I saw another uh, zombie, some other zombie video. It was a guy in Indiana. I, I couldn't believe what I was watching. I could not believe this. First of all, he was naked. Okay. Not big. And he's obviously in a different kind of state. And I'm not talking Indiana. But he's in a different kind of state. And he took on three cops. One of them was a woman. Two were men. And these cops, you know, there's a sound that a taser makes. It's a clucking sound. It's a tick, 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 tick. Like that. I must have heard that sound three times, three separate times with this guy, which means he was tased at least three times. Not only that, they were spraying him with pepper spray. And they are clothed, and he is naked, and they could not subdue this guy. And not only that, once they had him on the ground, he manages to get up and shake them off. And I think by this time, and I've watched this video a couple times, by this time, something is kicking into their brains, right? Something's kicking in, like, something's wrong here. You know, it's like, he's not supposed to be doing this. Because I'm sure that these people have tased other people before, and they've gone down like whimpering dogs. This guy was not doing that. So there's a certain amount of... of you know, once they've unleashed their attack and it hasn't really worked, there is a certain amount of shock that these people, I think, were experiencing. And then the guy takes his fist, and there was this big guy. He's this big, big, this big cop. I mean, you know, he comes, he's got these shorts, and he comes, he comes, you know, you know the type. He's like about six foot five, bald head, tiny head, a huge body. I was waddling in. He's one of the guys that, you know, does the, does the, uh, the, the taser. And this guy manages, the naked guy manages to get up, and he takes his fist, and he just completely decks this guy, knocks his big cop back, you know, a good four feet, and on his can. And then there's, <laughs> and then there's one cop between he and Daylight, and it's in front of him. And this and this naked guy does a forward roll. And as he comes up, he takes his foot and he kicks the cop in the chin. I mean, it's like full on Bruce Lee. Knocking the cop back, he pops up on his feet, slams him with his shoulder into the wall and takes off. And runs away, and they can't get him. He escapes. And you and you should hear the people talking about this on the video. It's crazy, absolutely crazy. America, we got a problem, and they've got other issues. It's not just America. You know, there was a video of um, a guy in China. Just, he was a bus driver. He got off a bus and he started eating the face off of a woman. This is this is this is not bath salts. You can't tell me that the guy in China was smoking bath salts. And he just and he flipped his wig. Now nah, there's something else going on here. And you know what? I'm gonna tell you after I play some music. I'm gonna tell you what I think is going on. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna play a little bit of uh my music, I'm going to jump into the chat room, 
And uh, when I come back, I'll give you what I think is causing the zombie effect. And um, we'll do live readings as well. So if you're waiting to get on, I mean, there's really nobody waiting to get on. But if you are, or if you'd like to call in, we can do that. And I'll do that when I get back from the break. All right, I just refreshed my board. There's nobody in there. So I'm going to play uh, Sound Vibrations. And um, I'll be back in about uh, mm, five minutes and four seconds. And I'll tell you why I think zombies are starting to proliferate. And we'll do live readings. See you in a bit. One of nature's greatest wonders is the ability of the human ear to distinguish among the millions of sounds around us. Listen. You will hear later how these characteristics are determined by the frequency, intensity, and form of sound waves in the air.
It's these vibrations which your brain interprets as sound. All right, that was uh, yours truly, Dominic Matrix, and that was Sound Vibrations. We're back. And Snow Links in Athena's Mind. Hang in there. I'm going to get to you. I'm going to get to you in two minutes, but I am going to tell you why we have zombies. I know you've all been waiting for this very important revelation, and it is at hand. Well, we have zombies because I think there's been something going on in Switzerland at CERN. Okay? Here's what I think. I think CERN is a portal, and um, I think that they've been uh, messing with this domain. It's a stargate. CERN is a stargate, and I think that they've opened that stargate up, and that what we're dealing with is we're dealing with entities. We've got entities in in this world now, uh, mass, mass, en masse, and I think there's also been kind of a proliferation of black technology through chemtrails and macrophages and nanoarrays that are almost like – well, they're almost like attachments or the foundation for for entities, multidimensional entities, to attach themselves through what's crawling around in our bodies as a result of chemtrails. That's my theory. That's my opinion. If you think about, if you, and if you understand monoatomic gold or monatomic gold, the theory behind that is is that the elite bloodlines consume this stuff, right? And by doing that, they allow themselves to be more receptive to higher levels of, of uh, possession and also moving in and out of time and space. Uh, if, you've, if you've seen the movie Dune or you've, or you've, or you've read the book, uh, Frank Herbert, I believe, when he's talking about spice, he's talking about monoatomic gold or monatomic gold. And if that's the case and being able to refine this stuff, which is what the alchemists were doing, that's what alchemy is. I mean, alchemy is theoretically – a spiritual practice and the refinement and transubstantiation of one's personality to get closer to one's soul. Theoretically, that's what that's about. But it's also the practice of turning not lead into gold, but gold is lead into monoatomic gold, which allows people to then to have a multidimensional experience with other energies, other entities. Now, if you dial that back and you look at aluminum, you look at barium, you look at all of these much baser metals, which we're all really inundated with. What does that make us? That makes us receptive. It makes us like antennae. You know, we're walking around as antennae, and we are able to uh, inadvertently take in vibrations as a result of this. Now, there's also strange creatures in chemtrails. I don't know if you've seen them, but they're very strange. They look very odd. They're called macrophages, and that's part of the chemtrail experience. So now what you have is you've got people running around, in, 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 you know, in essence being incredibly receptive to outside influence, whether it's a cell phone tower, whether it's a Gwen tower, or whether it's something coming through the portal. And I think that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing, we're seeing black soul technology, dark soul technology, and we're seeing a proliferation of these um, interdimensional entities. That's my take. And how do you how do you defend yourself against them? Well, there's a couple ways. And I'm going to get to the readings in a second, but I'm going to give you some advice. Very important. Very very important. The first thing that you have to watch is you have to watch your anger. All right, it's really important. Now, I have been a person who has not been afraid of getting angry because I feel like, you know, that's one of the hardest things for most of us to deal with is anger because anger is connected to power. There's a powerful, you know, they've they've done clinical studies on people when they're angry and they're way more lucid than people that are not angry. Their, their response time is quicker. Adrenaline is flowing. People get addicted to anger because they feel more alive. And you know what? They are, on some level, more alive. On some level, they are. In terms of this world, and we've been, we've been taught 
and condition to tamp down our anger. And, and we have these tepid responses. Well, it's okay to see an issue or to, to, to respond to something with a sense of justifiable and at times even righteous anger. What you don't want to do is you don't want to get into an angry place that is unjustifiable. You know, and here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about somebody that frustrates you. I'm talking about somebody that cuts you off. I'm talking about you're on edge just a little bit and somebody does something or says something and, and you snap. That's the anger you want to watch out for. Okay. You want to watch out for that kind of anger. Institutional anger, that's different, but it's that personal anger. So I think that what happens then is that there's a quickening in the body and something, something takes hold in those almost disproportionate moments of anger. Well, that's number one. Number two, you want to stay away from uh, drugs and alcohol. That's a given. You know, we gotta, you've got to be lucid during the, these times, incredibly lucid. That's number two. And number three, uh, orgone. We had Sh uh, Sherry Schreiner on here couple weeks ago, and you may want to experiment with taking some orgone and putting it on a bottle of water uh, and letting the orgone uh, interpenetrate that water and drink that water. Because apparently the zombie sect is afraid of orgone or it disables them. So you may want to explore orgone, not just uh, around, and I've got orgone all around my house. In fact, I've got a piece of orgone right on my monitor right now. So you may want to explore orgone. And, um, and, and, and these are just a few steps that you can take in order to retain your humanity and not allow, not allow something to possess you, okay? And I, look, I've got experience around this. I grew up with a father, loved my dad, but I would see him flip into rage and, and I would see a possession moment taking place. So I understand these things. Trust me. All right, let's go. Let's go to uh, Snowlinx, who's been waiting for 12 minutes. Let's find out who they are and what they want to talk about. Hello. Hi, Robert. I'm David in the chat room. Hi, David, with a Y in the chat room. How are you? I'm good. How about you? I'm good. Good. Thank you for calling in and being patient enough to listen. Oh, sure. You're welcome. Um, I've tried to call in before for a reading and uh, ended up too far down the queue. Well, you're, but, uh, you're, you're at the top of the batting order today. You're leading off. Wow. Cool. All oh, right. So, so yeah. uh, this is your time. Um, what, tell, me, um, tell me when you were born um, and what you want, want to, you know, explore together. March 18th, 1954. Okay. 11.30 p.m. All right. I'm going to do your... Uh, Los Angeles. I'm going to do your, your uh, solar here. Let's just do your solar because i got a bunch of people in the chat room. Uh, okay. March 18th, 1954? Yep. yep. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Looking at you, looks like you're a um, – we know you're a Pisces sun. Looks like you've got a Virgo moon, huh? So you've got the sun-moon opposition. Yep, yep. And Mercury and Pisces at two degrees. Uh, Venus and Aries – Eight degrees. So right now, that Venus has been uh, it's it's uh, engaged in the in the big T square right now, which is interesting. We can we can look at that and talk about that. Uh, you've big, got I'm sorry, the big what? T square. There's a big T square happening T -square. with with uh, Pluto and, and Uranus. So Uranus is right on your Venus as well. Uh, you've got uh, Jupiter and Gemini. So you get your Jupiter return coming, and and uh, and it will go uh, exact in 2013. You're going to be going through your second Saturn return. That happens in October. That's a big deal, you know, with Saturn and Scorpio, Saturn return. Your Saturn is retrograde, by the way. Uh, and then you've got um, Neptune um, in um, uh, Libra. So Saturn is right on, right on your Neptune as well. So there's a lot going on for you uh, in your chart. Saturn is squaring your natal Chiron in, in Capricorn. So lots of things happening. Um, what, what do you, what, what do you, what, what do you want me to look at or, or get into well, with you? If you don't mind, I'd like your opinion on something. Um, some astrologers, I, I have Jupiter opposing Mars in my chart. That's right. Um, Mars is in, is in Sagittarius, my rising in the first house. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and um, some sites that I've been to call it a, a Grand Cross, and some don't. Uh huh. Because the the uh, the, well, the two oppositions are not exactly squared. There are four squares, you know. Right, so it would be it would be your moon, right, in Virgo, is that right? Right. And and would it be uh uh your uh, let's see, would it be your would it be your sun? No, would it be your sun because your sun is too far away. Would it be Mercury? Is that what we're talking about or I'm talking about the the moon the the sun moon and the uh Mars Jupiter. Okay, there we go. So it would be the sun moon. Yeah. But but yeah, the degrees would be a little bit off. I can see that. You know, um yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, look, it doesn't necessarily have to be exact um, because the planets really are fairly close. And, I, and I'm, I, you know, I'm just looking at them in my brain, but they're fairly close and close enough so that you do have um, that cross. And it, it's a it's a mutable cross, um, which is which is which is interesting. I mean, uh, I think the challenge with the mutable cross is to get everything moving in the same direction, you know, to get the diversity of the of the mutable cross. So that, and if you, the, the interesting thing about all those planets is, with the exception of in some ways, um, Jupiter and Gemini, um, you're, you, you know, Pisces and Sagittarius are, in my estimation, you know, classically kind of spiritual and religious um, components in the chart. Or, or signs in the chart. So part of your mutable cross is integrating both of those energies. And the other part of, of the challenge with that is the is how how do you assemble the details? How do you organize it? Because you know Virgo is is really um, dedicated to details, and and Gemini is is, is dedi- dedicated to details, but in a different kind of way. Virgo is dedicated to details so that it can survive. Uh, Gemini is dedicated to details so it can learn. And so you've got to figure out how to marshal all these forces sort of together. You know, Sagittarius is big picture. It's all big picture. Uh, Pisces is big picture, too. It's about merging. It's about dissolving, you know, and Sagittarius is about expanding. So the challenge here is it's it's almost like, you know, if you look at it, the, the square uh, is and especially if you've got the ascendant on uh, Sagittarius, the, the the square or the cross is almost like the matrix of a planet. You know, it's this. You know, the you know for, you know, uh, it's like the north, the south, the east, the west. It's the component of a planet itself. And so, how do you how do you you know coalesce the energies, the creative energies of a planet? You know, Earth and water and fire and air. How do you do all that? I mean, in some ways, you're kind of tasked to not just understand how this, you know, works for you on a personal level, also on a planetary level, you know? I mean, you'd have some access to figuring that out on a planetary level, on, on a level of creation. I mean, these are big elements to kind, you know, to kind of deal with. And you're also dealing with with Jupiter in, in an interesting way because Sagittarius is ruled by by Jupiter, and then you've got Ge- you've got Gemini, uh, Jupiter and Gemini. So Jupiter is in play as well, and you know Jupiter is mostly gas. So you're dealing with elements that are not necessarily stable or solid. So so the op- so, I'm sorry, that's okay. So the key for you is is to is to you know figure out you know. How, how do you deal with the operating system? And it's mutable, so it's always changing. These signs are, you know, in changing signs. So, you know, I, I think probably based on Mars being in your first house, I would kind of use that as my, as my, as my kind of driving force. And because the first house is the house of identity, and if you've got Mars in the first house, you've got you've got a sense of passion. Uh, you, you, there's a sense of idealism with Mars in the first house. Sometimes there can be uh, a little bit of overzealotry with Mars in the first house. But I would I would generally tend to lead with that because that's you know one of the more prominent energies in relation to all of this. The opposition in Jupiter would be in your in your seventh house, 
which would be how people respond to you and who you who you bring into your life. Uh, and, and you wouldn't necessarily want to lean on that part of the angle or that part of the axis, if you if you, if you know what I mean. Um, that's and, and you've got you know moon would be your moon would be up in your tenth house, and it's not you know moon in the tenth house is okay if you you don't want to work with women, you know, or you want to you know, get involved in especially in Virgo if you wanted to be a doula or something like that. Moon in the tenth house would be great, but if, if I wanted to be a what a doula. A, a doula is like a midwife. They hang out with midwives. Okay. okay. You know, so you know that you know. Th- so again, we're dealing with kind of I wouldn't say it's a recessive energy, but it's not the most dynamic energy. And if we flip it down and we go down into your fourth house and the angle of the IC, there's your sign in Pisces, which is re- you know uh, reflective and, and it's in some level uh, even passive. So of all those energies, it's Mars. It, Mars and Sagittarius should be the leader and the driving force to kind of, you know, coalesce those energies. So you need to be driven by your passion. You need to be driven by your idealism. And, you, and there's always a sense of discovery and exploration and adventure. And if you can, if you can allow that to uh, have more play in your life, then, then you, theoretically you would get the moon and then you would get Jupiter and you would get Pisces to move along and, and, and be a part of the experience. So what's going to be interesting is this Jupiter opposition with your Mars. And I think that you have, I don't know what your love life is like or, you know, what your relationship is like. I've kept myself to myself for the last uh, seven years. Um, previously, I I have always been very passionate in my relationships with women Mm-hmm. And and I was very I found myself to be very codependent. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that, so, that, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I uh, I've I've kept to myself. It just seems to be the responsible thing to do. It also, I mean, while it's very hard sometimes, uh, I do get lonely sometimes. Nevertheless, most of the time, I'm clear about myself. You know, and I've come. Uh, I wanted to mention too. I've come to an energetic understanding. Mm-hmm. In the past year and a half, two years, uh, it's growing. Um, what you're saying is very much resonant with um, there's this thing um, called the code that I've been studying and using. Uh, very interesting, very basic uh, old folk knowledge from the Austrian Alps uh, uh, going back I don't know how long. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very simple. It has to do with birth date. For in for interestingly for me, the color in my in my uh, signature that's missing is red south, mm-hmm. and red is Mars. Yeah, you know, and and, mm-hmm. and red. So red, I have to I have to consciously bring red into my world, right? Because yeah. I don't wasn't born with it. So I have to focus on Mars somehow, and I'm not sure how to do that. Um, well, obvi- well. So, are you athletic at all? No, no. That's part of the problem with having a missing South. Yeah. Is I'm not. <laughs> I'm not inclined to be athletic. Well, here's here's what I would suggest with Mars uh, in the first house in Sagittarius. Um, you don't necessarily have to be, you know, athletic, um, but you could engage the body uh, in more Sagittarian kind of activities, which for me would be. Walks in nature, walks on mountains, um, you know, getting out. You need, with Mars and Sagittarius, you have to get out and you have to use that energy to expand with the environment around you. And Mars, I'm sorry, Sagittarius has a really resonant relationship with all things natural. So that's, that's how I would, that's how I would get involved with that Mars. Uh, in the first house. If you're not athletic, everybody can walk. Um, and, and walking in nature, and specifically walking up hills, you know, not huge hills, but n- enough so that you can build up your thighs and then you can, you know, break a sweat. That's that's Mars. It'll be a while before I can do that. I broke my left foot two months ago, uh, badly broke it. Uh, mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's going to be... Uh... It's probably going to be a year before I am uh, limping comfortably. Okay. Even. So, uh, so, then, that's, so then what we would do, David, is then we'd look at your son, right? And the next, the next 
I think easiest way for you to tap into that is water and water therapy, getting in a pool, um, you know, and not you necessarily walking on the bottom of the pool, but okay. moving your legs, stuff like that. I mean, if yeah. you can't, if you can't get out in nature and do the walking, you can get into like a zero pressure system in a pool. And that'd be very helpful, I think, for you with, with the foot. The foot, yeah. by the way, is Pisces. Yeah, uh, I know. Yeah. God. I don't know what this is about. It's huge. Uh, there are gifts in it. I know that, but I don't know what they are. Well, uh, you've got a lot going on. You've got this second Saturn return. And I think what you would want to do with the second Saturn return, uh, because your Saturn is at eight degrees and it's um, uh, retrograde, I think you'd want to look back a little bit during that Saturn return or, e or the ramp up to the Saturn return um, and see where in your life, you, you know, theoretically, you gave your power away. Uh, specifically, I would look at the age of eight or nine based on that degree. Um, because your second Saturn return, I believe, is about a, a reclamation of personal power for you. And, um, and again, water plays a fairly significant role because, you know, Saturn is in Scorpio. But I also get, too, you know, with Jupiter going into your seventh house, that this, 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 pot, this potential – for you to, you know, connect with another person and and um, allow another person into your life is very large. You know, you cannot deny a Jupiter transit in the seventh house on a Jupiter return. You can't, you know. Th I mean, the universe will set it up so that it will bring you people. It will say, hey, remember this? You remember what this was like? And I think that you, be, you know, being out of the, the loop for seven years and having time to work on yourself um, will bring somebody very different into your life. You know, it will be much more of a match vibrationally for you um, than than before. And um, and I get, I understand this idea of being um, accountable for one's energy. I totally get that. And but at the same time, um, I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily close that chapter in your life, especially with Jupiter moving through your. Uh, through your seventh house. Real quick, David, um, Uranus, <clears throat> excuse me, is also playing a playing a role in uh, Jupiter's kind of you know reascent into your into your uh, into your seventh house because your Venus is in Aries and Uranus is on there right now. And so when you when Uranus is on Venus, especially in Aries, it's uh, it's a moment of radical reappraisal about who we relate with and why. So that's going on in your chart, and Pluto is squaring that. So theoretically, you would be revisiting this whole notion of connecting with someone and why you would want to connect with someone and how you would connect with someone. And, and Uranus is going to be moving across your Venus for the better part of the next year because it goes – right now it's going to go back to six degrees, and then it goes forward to six and goes back over your Venus, which I think right around the same time – Jupiter will be in your seventh house. So I, you know, I think that you've got some very interesting moments in your future about reintegrating this idea of being with another person. And it will happen quickly, like somebody out of the blue, fast. It'll be like, wow, I wasn't expecting this. It just came out of left field. How am I supposed to integrate this? You know, am I ready to integrate it? Well, it's up to you at that point. But I think that the quote unquote universe, you know, uh, conspiring with your soul will bring you somebody um, very interesting and somebody that you're not going to have to do a lot of explaining to, because I think you're a fairly complicated person. And part of the bridge between you in terms of relating and not relating is finding somebody who is kind of on the same level as you and, and not having to go down and explain all this stuff that you understand or know or have experienced. And I think that bridge that bridge will be um, will be completed. That bridge will be um, it'll be it'll be intact. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, lastly, Saturn on your Neptune. Um, it's an interesting and it's happening right now, and, and it's going to be moving on in October. But really, between now and October, I think it's I think it's a good time for you to reevaluate your belief systems, and um, and and be uh, you know really lucid and and as um, mercenary as possible with your belief systems and and that's and and whatever 
whatever uh, whatever survives between now and the end of October in terms of your belief systems or in terms of, you know, how you uh, interact with your own uh, spirituality as an operating system, you're going to be taking that into your Saturn return, your second Saturn return as your tools. So whatever, whatever you decide to let go of, say this is no longer a belief I wish to hold on to, or this worked for me two or three years ago, but it's really not working for me anymore. If you eschew those things, whatever's left over, those are your tools for your Saturn return. And I think your Saturn return is going to be a good one, by the way. Thank you. That's marvelous. Okay. Well, David, thank you for calling in. I appreciate your patience and your fortitude and calling back, and uh, don't be a stranger. Thanks, Robert. All right. Take good care. You too. Bye-bye. All right, David. David with a Y. Let's uh, talk to Athena's mind. We are now entering Athena's mind, 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 mind. <laughs> That's that's what it's supposed to be. It's my artist's name. What is going on in Athena's mind today? Well, I'm the girl calling from Jordan. It's been a couple of months. That's what I thought. Nothing. What's happening over there in Jordan? Nothing. Life is really slow and easy. Um, I okay. Um, this 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 is not Pam Ella, is it? No, it's no. Athena. Okay. Because I have a, there's a woman who follows the website in the show sometimes. I think she also lives in Jordan, by the way. Ooh. Yeah, she likes it there. She says it's really cheap. It is. It's very cheap, and it's very easy. You don't feel like a slave to society. Ah, the good old days. <laughs> when living was easy and candy bars were five cents. They are five cents, really. See, I knew it. I know. I know. You can get like 20 pieces of bread for like a buck. All right. I'm there. <laughs> I'm moving. So what's, up, what's, so what's on your mind today, Athena's mind? What, 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 do you want, what do you want me to explore with you? What do you want to explore together? Well, can I, can I give you my birthday and uh, you tell me if there's any pop, anything popping up in my chart as far as moving? Like You're going to move from paradise where you can... No. <laughs> Just like moving, moving, like it's so slow. I mean, whether I oh. move forward in career, if I move... Ah, that kind of moving. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. When's your birthday? May 19th, 1968. Okay. Um, let's see. What do I have here? All right, so um looks like, what do you have, moon and Pisces, is that right? No, it's Aquarius. It's at the, it's at the, the last degrees of Aquarius. Yeah. Yeah, what, what degree, because I'm just looking off the ephemeris, and uh, what degree is that moon, do you know? No, but I know I'm born at 112 a.m., yeah. and then I have Aquarius and Aquarius. Yeah, I'm assuming, so you, you're double Aquarius. Yeah. So your son, let's see, no, you're, no, you're Taurus, right? May 19th, right? You're Taurus. Yes, I'm Taurus, but I have, I think, the moon and the ascendant. Or oh, the ascendant. ascendant. Yeah, okay, all right. So your moon is um, is conjunct the U.S. moon in Aquarius, which is what I was talking about at the beginning of the show, which is interesting. Uh, you've got a, a Mercury in Gemini and... Uh, Venus and Taurus, uh, very, very wide conjunction of the sun, nine degrees. Mars and Gemini, that's interesting. Uh, and Jupiter and Leo, Saturn and Aries. Uh, let's see, Pluto and Uranus. You've got that Pluto-Uranus conjunction. And then you've got Chiron and Aries. Okay, so you've got, you've got a fair amount of Aries energy with that Chiron uh, and, and then you've got Saturn. All right, so let's go to Mars. Let's take a trip to Mars. You've got Mars in Gemini. It's at seven degrees. Venus uh, has just passed over your natal Mars, okay? So, um, and if you're an Aquarius rising, that would mean that Mars would be uh, in your fifth house, which is the house of uh, romance, creativity, children, um, 
And it would have mean, meant also that the annular eclipse would have taken place in that house. Do you have any kids? Yes, I have two young boys. Okay. And um, what, how have they been over the last month or so? Good. Good? Okay. Um, Lonely, kind of. I don't know. Life in Jordan is kind of hard. It goes in waves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what I see with uh, Jupiter moving into your into your fifth house, um, which is your house of children and, and your Mars being there, is that I believe that you're going to listen more to your kids and about what you, your kids want and what they desire. That's going to be that's going to be more of a theme here uh, in the next few weeks. To be honest with you, now Jupiter moves up and it gets to I think like. 15 degrees and it moves backwards and it goes retrograde and it, and it goes back I think very close maybe 9 to 8 degrees in terms of your Mars so the initiating moment comes really in the next few weeks and between then and uh, where it goes direct and then retrograde which would and coming back to that degree I think around January February of 2013 you begin to have a dialogue with your kids about where you want to be and, um, and I think it's an important conversation. And I think that's where, if anything, uh, on some level, movement will take place. Now, creatively, creatively, Mars will stimulate, um, Jupiter will stimulate your curiosity. And, and, and I think that the key to quote unquote movement in your life, outside of your children, is to follow your curiosity. And it would be a really interesting time for you especially if you're living in a place that is affordable, you can indulge in a hobby or two. And so this is an open question um, to you. What are you interested in that you'd like to spend more time either studying or um, exploring or learning? Well, I, you know, I do a lot of that because I'm just an introvert. Uh, I'm interested in everything, but it's, it's what you're saying about the children kind of goes with my latest idea of, of opening a, like an after school, uh, center. Oh yeah. That fifth house. That would be terrific. Yeah. I like that. You just a place for the kids to go. Cause there's nowhere in this entire village. Not one, not one place for any. Yeah. I like that. That's perfect. That's a perfect thing to do, actually. So you create some stimulation for your kids. Uh, right. Fifth house rules acting. Acting? It, yes, it does. Absolutely. Leo, Leo was a great actors, you know. So I think I think that's a that's a marvelous idea. You want to create some movement in your life. Jupiter will support that in a in a in a huge way. Yeah, I'm all over that. Now, does it say anywhere in there whether this would be a joint thing for me? You know, like I, I find a partner, or or is it on my own? Is there well, I mean, I think Gemini, I, I think Gemini supports working with people. Yeah, that's what I like. That. <laughs> yeah, Gemini supports that. Look, you've got Jupiter and Leo. You know, Jupiter and Leo is, you know, it's again, it's I look, I think I think it's a great idea. Okay. That's a terrific idea. You know, the thing is, you've got Chiron and Aries, so you know you you need to take a leadership role. That's the that's the lesson with Chiron and Aries. Your true note is in Aries. So uh, while you know while it's important for you to work with people, that's your South Node. You know, right. you, you've got to be the one that carries the ball. This is you you, this is, you know what I mean? It's like you know, don't be afraid to 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 get out there and and do the do the legwork, be the face, you know, recruit people. Because once you throw your passion behind it with, with, uh, with you know, your true node and Chiron, especially Saturn, I mean, you can, you can get a lot done. Cool. Yeah. Well, good. That's, that's my plan. All right. So let's rubber stamp that. Done. <laughs> okay. So here's the deal, right? I want, yeah. I want you to call me back. Okay. And I want you to call me back um, before the end of the year. Oh, I will for sure. 
All right, and you report back, and you, you tell tell me and tell everybody else that's listening, you know, where you are with this. We're going to hold you accountable, okay? Okay, good. All right, and we want to hear a success story. Okay, okay. All right? Well, thank you. That, that, that makes me make sure that I do it because I get easily distracted because I have so many ideas. Well, that's it's all the Gemini, Mercury in Gemini, Mars in Gemini. <laughs> You know, you're you're, you're lucky. You're a you're a, a Taurus. That's good, right? Yeah, and you've got so. Venus in Taurus. That's good. So you've got some Earth. You've got that nice, you know, Pluto Uranus conjunction in in uh, Virgo. You've got Venus uh, trining Pluto. You could, you know, you're the type of person too that um, once you make up your mind uh, and come up with an idea, you can get people to invest in your idea too. Good. That's what I want to hear. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. And I will talk to you before the end of the year for sure. Good. Looking forward to it. Happy 4th of July. All right. Same to you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Let's go to the uh, 907 line. Here we go. Hi. You're on the air with Robert. Hello. Hi, Robert. How are you doing, man? I'm good. How are you? Um. Doing good. My name is Brandon from Alaska. Hi, Brandon. Um, I wanted to ask you when you were talking about the USA chart, um, what do you think is in the works as far as the election goes? Uh, I'm thinking with like everybody's so conflicted, like no one really likes Obama. Nobody really likes Romney. Um, you know, Ron Paul got like a really big kind of push and it was pretty exciting and it, he could still like mix it up. Um, at the convention and then uh the libertarian candidate is um gary johnson i'm wondering what you think if there could possibly be some kind of like just wild stuff kind of go down with the election yeah well you know the election is happening um on a mercury retrograde and um it's you know it's a tricky time and you know, I mean, we could see everything from voter fraud to, um, you know, machines going haywire. Um, would not be surprised if there was maybe even some form of, you know, civil unrest on election night. I mean, that Mercury retrograde in Scorpio is, is really tricky. And whoever gets elected during that time uh their elect their 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 term in office will be questioned throughout their their term they will not have uh, an easy time and in fact it, i i would actually could actually see that person getting elected whoever's elected uh quite possibly being impeached or there could be a a, a significant recall uh especially when uh, Mercury would uh, be opposite the Mercury retrograde uh, later in the year with Mercury and Taurus. So I think that that's a real possibility. The other thing that I've been uh, concerned about um, is what happens on the ramp up to the election. I've, you know, 10 years ago when George Bush was elected and I saw what was happening and I saw, you know, again, what happened in, in, um, 2004, I was, you know, I was concerned whether or not we would even have an election in 2012. You know, I, you know, and I'm still a little concerned about that because of, you know, what is, you know, hardwired into the Patriot Act. And, and there could be a possibility where if there is some form of civil unrest or civil disobedience, uh, whether it's real or whether it's staged, that they theoretically could potentially call off the election, you know, or if there's something happening on the global stage, you know, what, you know, we don't even know what's going to go down in London during the Olympics. I mean, there's some crazy shit, you know, that, that is, you know, being, I mean, they've got like missiles mounting on roofs on buildings in London. I mean, what is that all about? You know? So, you know, I, I'd be, I'm, if we have an election, then it happens under Mercury retrograde. And, and, and at that point in time, I'm just, you know, I'm concerned about, you know, 
what what happens as a result of that. Saturn's going to be in Scorpio. Jupiter moves into Cancer in 2013. And when Saturn moves into Scorpio, we're going to see a lot of this corruption rise to the surface. It's going to happen. It's going to be naked. It's going to be out in front. And people are going to have to really figure out, you know, uh, it's, it'll be shocking, I think, on some level. And Jupiter in Cancer is going to be very interesting because – at some point, especially in the early degrees and mid midpoint uh, Jupiter and Cancer, it's going to be trining with Scorpio. So I think that there's going to be a real interesting coalescence of energy during that time. And then as Pluto, especially the early part of uh, Jupiter and Cancer, opposes uh, Pluto and Capricorn, I think there are going to be some very defining moments in 2013 for this country. Um, in terms of Ron Paul uh, and the libertarian movement, Ron Paul is a Leo. And um, the eighth house of the United States is intercepted, and it goes from literally Cancer to Leo, and it comes out on the other side in Virgo. So I think in terms of Ron Paul's influence, there could be a lot of be behind-the-scenes activity um, with those delegates and with a lot of what I would call, you know, you know kind of real Tea Party uh, affiliations versus this fake Tea Party affiliation, like somehow – Mitt Romney morphed into a Tea Party candidate. I mean, are you kidding me? Um, and Gary yeah, that's Johnson, so right. Yeah, and Gary Johnson, interesting. I'm not sure. I'd have to spend more time with his chart um, and, and to under, understand more of who he is. I think he might be a guy that could be setting himself up for, you know, 2016, you know, if, if we're, we're even in a place where we're electing people in 2016. Again, I think it's, you know, we're, we're very different – you know, we're in a very different space now in terms of, of legacy and continuity. I think that I think we've walked off the continental shelf of continuity. Um, but I do think Ron Paul could be play a very prominent behind the scenes role um, as we move up towards the election because of that Leo son. Um, you know, would, could he be rubber stamped as a, you know, writing candidate? I mean, that's a possibility. But again, you know, we're dealing with these, you know, crazy voting machines. And, um, you know, that remains to be seen. So I, you know, I would say, if anything, you know, strap on your seatbelt, you know, because we're, we're in for a roller coaster right between now and November. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, thanks, man. All right. Take care. And, and uh, there. love the show. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Brandon from Alaska. It's always nice to hear people from far out places. Alaska. We're going to say, we'll put him on hold. Maybe he's listening. We'll mute him. Just in case. He's muted. Let's see. Is he muted? Let's talk to this uh, this line here. Let's, hold on. Hold on. There we go. Let's talk to the 000 line. This is the secret agent line. Hello, you're on the air. Hello? Going once, going twice. Adios. You there? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't know what was going on there. If you hey zero zero zero, call back in if you want me to talk or you want to talk. I just didn't hear you. If I don't hear you. You got to go. It's just the, uh, the 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 ground rules of the show. If I click on you, you got to talk. I'll give you I'll give you a few chances, but if you don't uh if you don't talk then you gotta go. I'm sorry. You just let me know you're listening. I'll put you back on mute and you can listen. You can do it that way. All right, it is uh twelve thirty four here on the left coast. By the way, I thought it was quite interesting as I was talking about the election. In unrest, there was a bunch of firecrackers going off. Maybe it's just a coincidence. These things happen that way, coincidentally. I miss firecrackers. I miss a lot of that stuff. I enjoyed lighting up bottle rockets, skyrockets. Here we go. There's somebody coming on here. Let's find out who they are. Hello? Hello? You there? Going once? Hello? Put you back on hold. Do this. Hold time. 
All right. Uh, are they there? Yeah. All right, not very compelling radio. Sorry. When I was a kid, I wasn't really a kid. I guess I was a kid. I was in my twenties, and uh, I was in I was in Chinatown with a buddy of mine. I think I was twenty, twenty-one, and we're we we're there, and I think we we're I think we we're buying fireworks. We we're buying fireworks from these Chinese guys, these young Chinese guys, and you know it was kind of cool. You know, here we are, we're in Chinatown, we're doing a deal, we're doing a firework deal, and these Chinese guys. <laughs> We were talking to them, like, hey, what you're seeing, blah, blah, blah. And they said, and this is, like, again, you know, this is like in the 80s. And they said, yeah, man, we own this town. <laughs> we own this town. We own Chinatown. This is our town. This is our turf, man. And we just cracked up, like, cool. Just give us your firecrackers. It was amusing. It was very amusing. I wonder what those guys are doing now. I bet you they're... uh Picture they're working for Google or something. That's what I think. All right. Uh, it's um, 1237, 22 minutes left in the show. And I'm pretty I'm pretty talked out. I mean, I could probably talk more, but um, I don't think I am. I'm going to wear my Captain America shirt today. I was into Captain America when I was a kid. I loved America. I still love America. What can I say? You know, I, I, you know, I, I, I love America. I do. I love America for all of its faults and its warts and, you know, all of its blemishes and all of its weirdness. I love this place. Would I live someplace else? Absolutely. I love other places too. But I love America. You know, my, uh, my Mars is conjunct America's Venus at four degrees. My Mars is zero degrees cancer. My Mars is in the seventh house of America. My sun is uh, conjunct on the other side, just on the other side. My sun is conjunct America's midheaven. And my Jupiter is in America's first house. I am at America's angles. I am an American. Even though I was not born here, I am an American. And I love this country. And it saddens me. It saddens me to see what's happened to it. It's tragic, actually. People have been hypnotized and entranced. And as a result, their sovereignty and their personal authority and their autonomy has been hijacked. And sadly, most of us just don't know who we are or what the hell we're doing. And if we do, we're fragmented. Broken families, broken homes, broken hearts, broken dreams, broken wings. And they're all trying to figure out how to put it back together. We're Humpty Dumpty. I just read the other day, in fact, it was last night. There's a guy here in California. His name is Mark Leno. And uh, he is a, uh, he was an assemblyman. He's an assemblyman now. He was a uh, councilman in San Francisco. He took over for Carol Migdon. San Francisco has a rotating seat for at least one gay member of the uh, city council. They went from Harvey Milk to Carol Migdon to Mark Leno. And Mark Leno moved out of San Francisco. I still live in San Francisco, but he moved into being an assemblyman for the state of California or, or a Congress, you know, some Congress of the state of California. And he was the guy that introduced the uh, Prop 8, the Gay Marriage Act. Mark Leno is gay. Now he's introducing the More Than One Dad Act, which means that uh, theoretically you can have three dads now or three moms. I mean, what the fuck is going on here? You know? We're legislating morality. 
And if you speak out against it, especially in California, you're considered ignorant or hateful or regressive. And so you're, sh you're shouted down because of this. And it's the worst form of censorship that there can be. And then people wind up cowering and saying things that won't offend people and going along with the tide. And as a result of this, the, the, the DNA of our, of our culture is being mutated and is morphing into something completely unrecognizable. Three dads. Three dads. Hey, I know. Why don't I, you know, hook up with a couple of other guys and adopt some kids? That's a great idea. Who made these people God? Who gave them the right? Who gave them the right to decide? I'll tell you right now, it's not going to end well. Not going to end well. Not with that kind of intrusion into our social and spiritual and philosophical lives. It's not going to end well. Because what we're moving towards based on this is, the, is what I would call the false Aquarian ideology or the manifestation of the false Aquarian matrix. I just put up a piece on uh, YouTube, to, not YouTube, Facebook today, and it's about Oscar Pistorius, who is the, um, he's from Brazil, and he's a double amputee, and he has these very uh, sophisticated springs that are part of his, uh, his, his body. He puts them on. And he's going to be running in the 400 meters in the uh, Rothschild London Olympics. And what's interesting about this is, is that he was not allowed to do this in China, but he's being allowed to do this in London. He's going to be on the 400 meter relay team. And in a lot of ways, this is the celebration of the transhumanist man or the transhumanist human. He will be, he will be the symbol for that as part of the Olympics. And the transhumanist um, culture is where all of this is headed. And it's away from the organic structure of being. It's away from, you know, clean water and natural food and organic food. It's moving towards synthesized foods, water that's fracked. genetically modified organisms, skies that are clouded with barium and aluminum, arrays of nanotechnology, and who knows what else, creating yet more synthetic layers upon which we try to eke out a natural existence. And as a result, we'll have synthetic relationships, synthetic unions, people that are able to go outside of the natural organic process of having a child and creating it artificially with artificial configurations of how those children will be raised. You see where the, all of this is headed. And I'm not saying it's, it's blasphemous because it's against the will of God. It is, I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm being a deist. I'm being a deist here. Okay. I'm a, I'm being a pagan. I'm not even bringing scripture into this. It is against nature. When we see nature, we see we see the coherence. We see the coherence of we can look at two two geese who mate for life and have their little broods and they and they tend to their broods diligently. Now there are parts of nature that go against the grain. Whales kind of go against the grain a little bit. You know, whales get together and they got a whole different thing going on. They go down to Mexico and well they mix it up. And, uh, that, you know, I mean, literally, the gray whale travels down the coast, and they, and they mate in these, you know, these giant sort of, you know, orgies at sea. But look, they've earned the right, okay? They've been here a lot longer than we have. They've figured it out. They've earned that right. 
we haven't quite earned that right yet. They're they're operating at a level of conscious and intelligence that can handle it. But this is all going against nature. And I got to tell you, it's not going to end well. You know, they just found Higgs boson, the quote unquote God particle. Who knows where the hell that's going to go? Good luck with that. Good luck with that. We are introducing elements into our domain, and I'm not sure we can handle it. Look, if there was a spiritual equivalent of Higgs boson, okay, and maybe there is. I, you know, maybe I'm just too limited to see it. You know, I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy in his living room right now. Maybe I'm just too limited to see it. But if there was a spiritual equivalent of it that said, guess what? You're ready. You're ready to steward this kind of information and this kind of energy, and maybe even create worlds, okay? You're ready because spiritually you've evolved the way. But I'm looking around at the planet. I'm not really sold on that model. Sorry. I'm not. Because I don't see that in action. So what we've done is we've brought something into our environment again, like the atom bomb, the hell bomb, nuclear technology, where we probably really weren't ready at that time to integrate that. All right, so let me tell you um, a little bit more about my website. It's robertphoenix.com. And, uh, of course, you're listening to this show. On Friday, I got, I've got at least one guest on on Friday. Uh, it'll be interesting. Uh, it's a director who has um, done a film about uh, the life of Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, who came from Tibet, and um, it's a documentary about his life, and I'm going to watch it over the next couple of days. And it should be quite interesting, to be honest with you. Looking forward to that. Um, and he uh, was a very pivotal figure in the uh, spiritual movement in America in the 70s and in the 80s and influenced a lot of people. He uh, helped found the Naropa Institute, along with people like Allen Ginsberg and Ram Dass. Uh, and I'm going to have the director of that film on the show on Friday. Um, what else? Well, my website, Robert Phoenix. Look, I have right now I've got a chip in on my website, robertphoenix.com. It's on the right-hand corner of my website. I'm in a fundraising drive, okay? My goal is to get a 1,000 people to donate a dollar because I don't, I don't gate my content. I don't make people pay for the interviews. I don't make people pay for mini readings or radio shows. I don't make people pay for uh, what's on my site. The only thing I do uh, uh, have a pay uh, service is with my newsletter, which is a subscription-based newsletter. That's the only thing. So I make all this content free. And if you feel as though you'd like to contribute to keeping this content free or at least allow me to continue to create the content in, in, in this way, then please go by my site and donate what you can. My goal is 1,000 people uh, or 12, 1,100 people to donate a dollar. If you could do that, wunderbar. It would be, it'd be fantastic. That's my goal. Um, because that way it would be quite helpful in terms of being able to keep all the power and electricity on to continue to do this. All right. Have a great 4th of July. As they used to say with Red Devil fireworks, be safe and sane. <laughs> safe and sane. You give people fireworks, trust me, safe and sane does not enter into the equation. But be safe and sane and enjoy. Enjoy this 4th of July. Who knows how many we're going to have like this. Take it in. Embrace it. It's your time. And even if you're not an American, embrace it anyway. The dream of freedom is yours. Don't ever let it go. All right. Use your head to discern what's real and your heart to stay open to what's possible. I'm Robert Phoenix. What is this? Anthem. Should I play this? Could it be Jimi Hendrix? I don't know. Let's just see what this is. I don't know what it is. It's, a, it's on my... On my studio. Let's find out. 
I'll see you on Friday.